Welcome to the Maintenance Mavericks podcast, a podcast for people who want to learn all things about maintenance and reliability. I'm your host, Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Each episode, I'll be meeting with an expert from within our maintenance community to take a deep dive into topics sourced from our maintenance community Slack group. And today, I'm super excited to have Rick Clonin here on the show. Rick has worked in numerous facilities across maintenance reliability roles, giving him a super great deal of experience in root cause analysis. He's also the co-author of a book titled Engineer's Guide to Preventive Maintenance, Mitigating Asset Risk Through Preventative Action. Welcome to the podcast, Rick. I'm super excited to learn from you. (laughs) I'm excited to be here. Let's do this. All right, let's do it. Um, First question, the way that we always kick things off, Rick, is have you share a little bit more about yourself, your background, and how you were first introduced into this wonderful field of maintenance reliability. That story that started a long time ago. I started out in the nuclear Navy. That was an opportunity I took straight out of high school. I was on a submarine. You can see the, I think it's right there. Right. Um, I started off on a submarine and was a maintenance mechanic on, on a, a fast attack submarine. Didn't care for the isolation, but I loved the work and the teammates. So I left with not a big plan, got into industrial maintenance as a technician, did that for a long time, 15, 20 years. Um, and I was working on a breakdown and my manager at the time came up to me and I was talking about root cause and saying these things. And I hate that this happens over and over again, and all this stuff. And apparently I was saying the right thing. I went back to clean up. And he called me into his office and I thought, well, I must be in trouble. And he handed me Ramesh Galati's book, Maintenance Best Practices. Well, I mean, best practices, you need to read this. And I said, well, all right. So I went home that weekend, flew through the entire book, came back, slammed on his desk and said, why aren't we doing this stuff? And he just chuckled <laughs> and, you know, full circle. Now Ramesh is one of my friends. He lives five miles down the road from me. You know, I've got a signed Ooh. copy of his third, but it's just, it's just great to have that community. So that's how I got turned on to it. Since then I have moved into several different roles, uh, planner, scheduler, uh, maintenance supervisor, manager. I uh, started from the ground up and installed a new CMMS from nothing to 200,000 assets. It was just, it's just been a heck of a journey. And then now I'm the you know, a trainer and coach at your DCO. That's awesome. What an awesome story. It sounds like you've gone through the ringer of different roles, seen the good, <laughs> seen the bad, seen probably a ton of great along the way too. I've been, like I said, many levels within the organization. I've seen, I've seen a lot for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, today's topic is going to be centered around PM optimization. I know that You know, Rick, you co-authored a book on mitigating asset risk through preventative action. Obviously, I'm sure that a lot of our listeners are familiar with PM optimization. I want to ask you the question, though. What does PM optimization mean to you? I want to make it clear that the intent of PM optimization, before we get started about what it is, the intent of PM optimization needs to be communicated first. And that is that we can't just go in and say, we're going to do PM optimization and everything's going to get better, right? It's not a silver bullet. You're not going to have an asset that's running poorly and just all of a sudden do PM optimization. And, and now you're going to have a, a shiny asset that you're going to be able to tell everybody how great it runs. That's not how it works. There's a lot of things that have to go into it first, but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. And that typically is that we have an asset that is not performing correctly or meeting our expectations. And we're having uh, a root cause analysis shows that we're having failures that could have been prevented. Uh, PM optimization, just like any of the other improvement activities, uh, lets the asset talk to us and tell us what it needs. But the most it can tell us is what the design inherent reliability of that asset is. Okay. So we can't exactly show up and say, okay, we've got this machine that's running 40 parts a minute or it's 50% uptime. We want to get it to hundred percent uptime or 80% uptime. You know, the reliability of that asset is what it is when you bolt it to the floor. That's all we can do. We can't maintain in reliability. So I want to make sure everyone knows that we're only going to get as good as we can get with that asset. We can't make that asset better without doing a redesign of the asset. That's the only way to improve the reliability. So if you think about this tires on your vehicle, right? And I always use this example, the rated by miles, right? Your mean time between failures, basically. So I've got 60,000 mile tires on my vehicle and I want to make them run longer. And I always ask this to, to my students and they say, well, you know, you got to check the error. I'm like, okay, that's a good maintenance item. Got to make sure that happens. You know, and everyone sometimes will say something about operating it, not peeling out and all that sort of thing. In the end, they're talking about how to operate the asset, but still you're only going to get 60,000 miles out of those tires. Yeah. If you want to have longer life tires, longer life out of your tires, you have to buy longer life tires, right? There's no maintenance you can do to extend the life of that. And I want to make that clear to our listeners that you can extend the meantime between failures to the inherent level with good PM optimization. To answer your initial question, that PM optimization is making sure we get there. Yeah. Right? We're not doing things that aren't impacting the life of the asset, but we're not missing things that are. Where do you think most organizations are in their PM optimization journey? Do you feel like we're far behind in what we should be doing? Do you think we're 
<laughs> so scope creeps a thing, right? Where they are mostly is they have a vendor PM that they got when they bolted the thing to the floor and wired it up. They hand it over to maintenance and said, man, good luck. And then the maintenance guys and gals come in and they treat every breakdown. They put the new parts on it and they do those sorts of things. And when somebody was called, it's funny because a PM task doesn't usually get added when someone gets called at two o'clock in the afternoon. It's when they get called at two o'clock in the morning that someone gets adds a PM task to the list, right? Oh, we got to check that thing forever. I had to check at one of my previous maintenance jobs. I won't tell the company, but I had to check a limit switch for operation. It's a two-person job. I had to climb up, actuate the switch while someone looked at the PLC to make sure it was coming on. I mean, we basically just used up a cycle of the, <laughs> of the switch, but because that limit switch became loose at one point in time, we had to make sure it was it was the wrong task for the wrong failure mode, right? So I would say that many of you know, your listeners probably don't have failure-based PMs with a failure mode called out in the task. And there's a lot of scope creep for sure of non-value added stuff. And, you know, I find that nobody likes to delete things, parts from the spare parts. No one likes to get rid of anything, no matter what it is. And it's very difficult to remove these tasks. And you really have to show why the task is being removed and saying, you know, we shouldn't check the pump is one everyone likes to use. What are we checking the pump for? You know, let's put in a, let's put in a failure mode to say, check the pump for this, because if you give it that check the pump to 10 different people, they're going to get 10 different results. You got to remove that variability. You bring up such a good point because I think it comes back to this, like no one will ever get fired for adding a task, like adding something <laughs> on. Right. Right. But people will get yeah. fired. There's this inherent fear of, of removing something. You bring up a good point when we're doing root cause analysis as to why things happen. And we get to that human factor of why it happened. And it was, you know, Ryan Chan removed that from our storeroom because it had been used in six years. <laughs> Let's fire Ryan. They don't go beyond the, well, why did he remove that? They don't care. And when you're put on the carpet to say, well, why did I remove that task? And it's like, look, there's things called anomalies. They happen. We don't have to put a plan in place for a one in a million. That's non-value added. Unless yeah. the consequence of failure is so high, we have to do it, or it's regulatory or those sorts of things. Right, right, right. Then you should be fired. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rick. I appreciate that. <laughs> you had a good run, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> this brings up a really good topic around like the PM optimization of a single asset. And we're kind of talking about how difficult it is at a singular level. How do you do this at a much larger scale for the entire plant at a local level or at a national level? It's funny because that question at first, when you're starting to say it, it, it kind of gave me a little bit of pause, but the answer isn't as difficult as it sounds. And it all goes back to how you set up your data, right? So if you have, assuming we have pumps in our CMMS, you know, if you don't have a CMMS, you really need to get one. And that that, that uh, there's attribute data and transactional data through the work orders, but that attribute data, people overlook that often enough. They think it's simple enough to put pump one, two, three, four, five. They put it in their nice little parent-child relationship hierarchy, and they have all of that stuff in there, but then they don't put stuff in there like, well, what kind of pump is this? What classification is this? Who's the vendor that we bought it from? When did we install it? Those sorts of things. But when you have more data there, that's just another field you can put in to slice and dice your data from. And so when we think about leveraging PM optimization, if you have 10 pumps in your facility, but there's 10 facilities and they're all the same, you can effectively do optimize one and perhaps, perhaps you get a hundred out of that, right? Yeah. And leverage it so quickly. So for example, if you take and, and, and you say this pump is the exact same pump everywhere else, even if the context is slightly different, it's going to fail pretty much the same way. And so then we just look and say, okay, well, this pump is run 24, 7, 365. This one run twice a week. Well, the, the frequency of the tasks aren't going to have to be the same. And then you also have criticality involved in there to say, how do we do that? But the big thing is you have to make sure is what can I group together to leverage my effort? Because nobody has time to optimize a hundred that no one does that. That's how we get vendor managed or vendor PMs, right? Just straight up, whatever they have in the, in the book. Next question there is like, who should be responsible for PM optimization? Is it the reliability team? Is it, you know, the maintenance team? Is it, do we hire a third party to really give us that neutral objective view of our assets? It depends. First and foremost, somebody who is forward looking of the asset, also understanding what's been going on. So you can't just optimize PMs without looking at past history. Okay. That's a, probably a waste of time in a lot of instances. You have to understand you know, the triggers for PM optimization should be poor performance, high expectations. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, that high expectations, that's critical systems list, the criticality analysis and all that sort of thing. What are my bottlenecks? You know, what are my big impact assets? Those sorts of things. You shouldn't be doing PM optimization on the water fountain outside of the break room probably. But in the end, once we have that high expectation set, 
now we have that target. And when things tend to dip below that for a long period of time, then we should say we should do PM optimization on that. Whoever is looking at that in your organization and identifying that delta between expectation and reality, that's the first person to get involved saying, hey, we got a problem here and this is what we need to do about it. In the past, I've had things, we had a monthly meeting called our bad actor report meeting. And we would Pareto out our top 10 items and determine which ones do we need to go get. Obviously, if we could identify the first one, and it was a measurable degradation issue. We could put some sort of task or technology. That's what we did. Oftentimes it was a design issue. And again, PM optimization, you'll be surprised how much design comes out of that, right? Mm -hmm. Redesign. Mm -hmm. Reliability engineering is probably the people that need to look at it, but they have to have, I mean, who's going to implement these yeah. These changes, it becomes a work order to, to fix it, right? And you alluded to a good point that I think is oftentimes overlooked, like the PM optimization, you know, as we think about like adding more and more and more into our work days, into our, our, our work plans, the PM optimization opportunity has to be looked at from a prioritization play. We've only got, you know, X number mm -hmm. of days in a week, only X number of hours within a day. It's not a, so much about like, what are the great things that we could add on to the end of our day that'll benefit the business? It's more about of the 1000 things that could be good for our business and our equipment, what are the top 20 that are gonna have the highest levels of ROI for the business? I think that's mm -hmm. kind of like the mindset that people often forget when we're doing these PM optimizations. It's optimizing the return on time versus saying, is this a good or bad thing to do for the business? You actually bring up a wonderful point. And I, I say, whenever we're doing these sorts of things, and it doesn't matter what it is, whether you're starting a new uh, work management system or whatever, it's going to be a slog at first. It's going to be hef heavy. And we, because what I say is we have to stop the bleeding. Whatever the bad performance is, we've got to address that, okay? And we can do that a multitude of ways, but we have to be effective before we worry about efficiency, okay? Oftentimes people see that, and that effectiveness manifests itself in add another task, right? We bought this, we bought this vibration analyzer, go analyze everything. And then we have so much data coming, we don't know what to do with, right? So be effective first, but then realize we have to concentrate on efficiency at some point once we become effective. Um, and that can look a lot of different ways. But if we just focus on the efficiency, first, if you go into PM optimization saying, I just need to figure out what I can get rid of and cut because I ain't got time to do all my PMs, you're going to be in trouble. Um, Rick, you also alluded to having the right data. And, oh, yeah. and obviously you also mentioned, you know, being able to optimize your PMs requires you to have the historical real-time data on your equipment. What are some best practices to make sure that your data, the information that you've got is accurate, consistent, and complete at the times that you need it in order to make these analyses? So you said accurate consistent and complete. Those are three different things, Ryan. <laughs> Am I asking um, too much? <laughs> it's funny. I, I presented at a conference recently and I said, does anybody here have good data? And one person actually raised their hand and I, I handed them my clicker and said, you should be talking up here, buddy. Um, because nobody ever thinks they have good enough data, right? And I'm sure in your previous life, you, you didn't have good enough data. So it all starts at the beginning. And you know, many of the teams that I coach on work management, which is another one of the things I love to talk about is how do we start that? How do we go from work identification to documentation? And what's that transition like between dripping faucet to now we're going to go ahead and fix it, right? Um, and what are those guidelines and rules we have set in place? How can we leverage our tools like our CMMS to say we have a minimum acceptance criteria? Do we have people put in place to serve as gatekeepers to our, to our CMMS uh, backlog? I look at it like we have to protect our backlog at work requests. At closeout, we require the same diligence but that's, that's protecting our, our asset history. So there's two points. There's when it enters into the CMS and when it technically leaves the work process and sits off in archival data, that we absolutely have to make sure we can have no defects beyond this point. And you know, we did it through a reporting and we had meetings and we review, a lot of places have two shift meetings or end of shift meetings or pre-shift meetings. You know, you can leverage many of the CMS systems now can send out an email with a really pretty report of what happened. And you can have it look like, hey, these are the, the mandatory fields we want to have uh, on our work requests, and our work closeout. And it can be one of those things that's kind of a twofer. You know, you go over what happened, but you also check your quality there and, and, and submit it back to the person that made the error and train them back up again. You can't do PM optimization without data. Yeah. I always say with, without data, emotion creeps in and emotion yeah. is awful. Work prioritization, PM optimization, spare parts, it's all done emotionally and you can't do it that way sustainably. Yeah. What I hear from that is in order to ensure accurate, consistent data, 
it all comes back to the, the technology that you use, tons of configurability. And, and then the second thing is like accountability through reporting is another big uh, opportunity there. I, if you remember my bio, I said I implemented a CMS from the ground up and I did with a, another team, but I was the lead on that. But what I found out is, you know, putting the data in, establishing our work management system. And I had to train almost 80 technicians, how to do it, 200 people in our organization overall, how to at least look into the system and get out what they wanted out of it. But that other part of it, that 130 people or so that were just users of the system and not data people, which is what our maintenance crafts and engineers were that just needed the data out of it. That was my customer, right? That was who needs it. The quality department needed to know what we were having quality defects on and those sorts of things. And so I would write these reports and I realized, goodness, once you get all your stuff in the CMS, your life begins. Yeah. Now you get to play with it. I told the technicians, we're requiring you to do all these things. And yes, it's going to sound hard at first, but if we don't do anything with it, shame on us. And so I made sure we did something with it. Yeah, we have a big thing here at Upkeep. There's kind of three com critical components into making sure that we make the best decisions. It's collect the right data, display the right insights. So what do we do with this data? We, we gather insights from it. But then the third critical piece is we take action off of these insights. And what I hear from you too is yeah, kind of exact same mode. Of oh yeah. Sure that we collect data inside a CMS ensure that your team is actually looking at analyzing and gathering insights from it. And the third thing is like, what the hell are we going to do with these insights? We actually have to take action off of it. If you miss any one of these three, then you could get thrown into this game of making decisions based off of emotion. Yeah. Yeah, can't do it. It's awful. And you know, it, even, even those people that have been working in a particular area for 30, 40 years that are going to retire in a couple of years, you know, and, and they just know how the business runs and they have the ability to just effortlessly direct effort and, and, and technicians and all kinds of stuff. And they run a facility perfectly. They're doing it on emotion. It's all in their head. There's no system in place. It's all here. And so we're finding a lot of my clients, especially with the aged workforce, optimizing their tasks and understanding how they how to get what they have here into the CMMS, repeatable coming out. It's a huge task. And don't wait until they're about to retire to start doing it. Get that, get their legacy on <laughs> into the CMMS, you know? Yeah, yeah. I totally agree with that. We we see that way too often. We have a segment at the end of our show where we do this like quick fire set of questions where I ask a question, we get your immediate thoughts. You ready to jump in? Do it. All right, Rick, um, I'd love to know what's a technology that you're super excited about that you think will leave a lasting impact on our industry. So the first thing that came to mind when you said that was democratization of data, making sure that everybody in the organization has access to the, our metadata in some fat, form or fashion. We have so many fields on an asset or in a work order and how those two marry together from those two different tables, but how we can display that to the people that need it. Um, I had technicians that said, hey, I want, I cover this group of assets every month. I want the top 10 hitters from here every week. I want the top 10 hitters for here. I want the biggest failure mode we've had. You know, we have had people where I worked before take a year's worth of work order data, do it by problem, part, cause. And we're able to say it takes Joe 45 minutes to fix an electrical problem on this group of assets, but it takes Frank two hours and they find a Delta there and a training need from the data. Yeah. Right. But that's, that's just because everybody had access to it, right? So that's the biggest thing I think it is in the mobile inputs. I mean, the technologies that we use to find failures and stuff like that, they're going to keep it progressing and sensors and all of that. But to me, it's that democratization of data and the freedom we have with figuring out what our assets are telling us. No longer is it going to be a singular person that's responsible for taking in all this data and like analyzing it and, and making sure that we make decisions off of it now. To your point, it's this democratization of data, which enables anyone within the organization to pull up a report and figure out what they believe is best decision based off of the data that they, they see. Favorite memory of the biggest win you've had within the maintenance reliability space? I've been doing this a lot. There's things I liked that I did, some projects I worked on that were fun. But the thing that gave me the most pleasure was I was teaching at a place one day about three years ago. And it was one of those uh, organizations that I thought, you know, they're, I was going in there, I was doing my job, but um, one of the students came up after me and he said, um, and they would count their work order backlog by jobs. And I had mentioned, you know, hey, you need to do this in hours and for various reasons, right, to measure the backlog and, and the effort hours. And that little nugget of conversation basically changed his career. And I can't overstate that. It took him a long time to go back and calculate the backlog in hours. 
He communicated the risk to his organization. The organization had no idea that's how risk, risky the backlog was. They ended up putting plans in place, hiring in contractors. But this one student of mine took that and you know th that mentorship that we've had throughout his career the last three years and watching him just take off like a rocket. He presented at a conference on his project and I was just so proud to watch him do that. And that's the part that I love. At a certain point in your career, you know, we all get to where, hey, I wanna just give back. And that was an instance where I absolutely did that. And I, I love that story and, and that person doing that. That's awesome, Rick. Let's go flip side to that question. Mistake that you've learned a ton from. Yeah, I've never made a mistake, Ryan. Next question. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually a PM optimization mistake. So early on, when I first got into maintenance and reliability, I realized I'd just been a technician and I realized our PMs were absolutely non-value added. And so one of the things that we ended up being tasked me with is, you know, going out and doing some PM optimization. And I had created all of these tasks on all of these components without a single consideration. I'd been to one conference, so I knew what I was doing. Uh, without a single bit of co uh, consideration to the outside world. I operated 100% in the vacuum. Not only that, the dangerous part was I had full access to the CMMS and writing PMs and turning them on. And let's say it was a Monday, I turned on all these PMs for two assets, didn't tell the planner. Shortly thereafter, the planner came out of his office and jumped up and down on my desk, explained to me how the hell was he supposed to get all this stuff done with, and I said, well, that's a good point. I learned how to turn off PMs in my CMMS that day. That was a fun one. But uh, <laughs> no, understanding that when you do PM optimization, that you have to level load the output of the process and to talk to your planner and your maintenance manager and make sure that you're not over-resourcing people. Because if you have all these PMs and you can't get them done, you might as well not have them at all. And it's just frustration. Rick, where do you go to find yourself learning as you continue to create more educational content? Where do you go for new ideas? So lately I've, I've been kind of stepping out of the maintenance reliability space and gotten into some leadership learning. The one for me that really resonated was uh, How's the Culture in Your Kingdom by Dan Cockrell. He was a VP at Magic Kingdom in Orlando. And just how they dealt with problems, the Walt Disney Group. And the, the one that really, really resonated with me, I read it and I listened to an audio book, was uh, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Wilnick and Lee Babb and the two Navy SEALs. Uh, you'd think that, you know, Battlefield, you can't learn from that very much. But they, they actually break each lesson down into two steps, or three steps rather. And uh, it really is an incredible book about team culture and understanding, you know, obviously we're not talking about bullets here and they may feel like bullets coming from operations sometimes, but getting everybody together and on the same page and the value of communication, the value of prioritization, the value of strategy and tactical and having both pieces and letting everybody understand more democratization of data, believe it or not, democratization of information for sure and making sure everybody's on the same page how important that is. Don't assume because I'm talking to you, you understand what I'm saying, that sort of thing. Yeah. Just really good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe as a follow-up to that one, best piece of career advice that you, you've ever been given? Do it. Just do it. I have been lucky that I've had a lot of people support me. Um, you know, I, I had a manager when I left one facility within my previous job to another facility, they weren't very happy about it. And I basically had to tell them that, you know, if you look around at his coaching tree, uh, he's basically the Bill Belichick of our organization. I said, everybody you, that works for you goes on to leadership roles someplace else. I said, maybe your job here isn't uptime. Maybe it's making leaders of, of people. And so taking somebody that you can find, slither up underneath their wing and make them be your mentor. And then when you, the moment that you can reach down and remember you didn't get there alone either um, and share that information. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rick, for going through yeah, this quick set of questions with me. Lastly, can you share with our listeners the different ways that they can follow you on your journey and connect with you? Yeah, the easiest way is LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on there. You know, I like to speak at SMRP and all the other conferences and things of that nature, but LinkedIn is the community that I'm at, the, the Slack community as well, or just our clone at eradishow.com. All right. Thank you again, Rick, for joining us. And thank you to all of our listeners yeah, thank for tuning in to today's episode of the Maintenance Mavericks podcast. My name is Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm super active. And lastly, you can find myself and Rick in the Maintenance Community Slack group. You can feel free to ask us any follow-up questions from today's episode or suggest future ones. You can sign up at upkeep.org and I hope to connect with all of you soon. Until next time, thanks again, Rick. Thanks, Ryan. See ya.